That's Enough Out of You podcast is sponsored by Todd John's Law. Unfortunately, bad things happen to good people, whether it's the result of an auto accident caused by the carelessness of another driver or being charged with a crime. Dealing with the aftermath of a personal injury accident or being involved with the criminal justice system can be extremely difficult. That's why, whatever you're facing, you should never go it alone. You need an experienced attorney who will stand by you every step of the way. Todd is experienced, licensed, trusted, respected, and guaranteed. No one will work harder or more diligently on your behalf, and he will personally handle your case from beginning to end. Located on Drinker Street in Dunmore, Pennsylvania, Todd has been representing the legal rights of Scranton and Wilkesbury personal injury victims and those accused of a crime for over 20 years. At Todd John's Law, the utmost priority is ensuring that your rights are always protected and that your case is resolved as quickly and fairly as possible so that you can move on with your life. Call Todd John's Law at 570-876-6903. With Todd John's Law, you will receive equal justice under the law. Hello, 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 and welcome to That's Enough Out of You, the podcast. I am your host, your main host, Bill Rader, and joining me as always is my co-host, Mr. Sean Kane. Big fella, what's going on? Billy Raids, how you doing, buddy? We're doing good. We're doing good. We're running around like crazy today. It's a busy, busy Saturday. I went from literally running running this morning to uh, driving, uh, driving Jeremy over to his drum lesson and then getting here just in time to start start the podcast but uh, it's a good thing that we are here today because uh, we have a special guest who is joining us i can't even i don't know if this is number f- <laughs> number five or five i don't know <laughs> we need you're, you're, titles. Like, you're like a uh you're you're practically one of the hosts now lisa she's so. a regular lisa's a regular exactly. <laughs> like that i like that <laughs> um, so peace the great author author of the uh the the book um oh my gosh the title a lie too big to fail too big lie to too big to fail I'm, my apologies that's all right it's the, <laughs> it's the right the true story of the RFK assassination which is a, a great read I I highly recommend everybody read that book fantastic fantastic book fantastic work as always thank you. <laughs> All right, so we got a, we got a really good topic today, Sean. This is an interesting one, and this is kind of new information, right? Well, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about Alan Dulles's uh, day calendar, and this this is just fascinating. And you know, I know the first thing that people are probably going to think about is why would Alan Dulles put anything down on his day calendar that that's incriminating? But I would say that, and Lisa, I talked to you about this. This is consistent with Alan Dulles's behavior. You know, he's always been the type of person that that kind of like he's peeking in the doorway, letting you know that he's behind everything and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, which is why all these coincidences linking him to like Oswald with like George the Mornshield and the pains and all that. Um, but in his mind, in his words, coincidences don't exist. You know, so I think this is consistent with his behavior. He he you know, so powerful that, um, you know, he, he does, he wants people to know what he did. So anyway, I want to start Lisa with the origins of this calendar because you're the person that found it. So do you want to talk about how this came about and then how it disappeared at the university of Princeton? Yeah. (laughs) Yes. So first of all, it was John Armstrong who first alerted me that Alan Dulles's papers were online at the Princeton library. So of course I dove in and, and at that point, the, how do I want to say the website was very clear. It was super easy to find things in Alan Dulles's, his calendars, his correspondence, policy papers, memos, speeches, transcripts. It was all laid out very well organized. And so, of course, I went right to the calendar section and I browsed, you know, looking for 
it's funny because even then, I think it made it look like the calendars only went as far as 1961 in the table of contents. But I clicked the last one anyway, and sure enough, it actually went all the way to 67, to literally December of 67. So naturally, you know, my curiosity, I turned right to November 22nd. And what I saw there was amazing. And maybe you can put the picture of this on your website with this podcast. I don't know how that works. Yeah. Or oh, we, at we least will. Yep. in the blog. Yeah. Um, but there's three days pictured, November 22nd, 23rd, 24th. And it says the farm, the farm, the farm. And I know from studying the CIA for years that the farm is Camp Peary, uh, the CIA's training facility down in southern southeastern Virginia near Newport News and Williamsburg. And on the top of the counter, because I also noticed that when Dulles had a flight at the start of the day, he wrote it at the top of the counter. When he had a flight at the end of the day, he wrote it at the bottom of the counter. It's human nature to do so. And, you know, top is 8 a.m., bottom is 6 p.m., whatever. <laughs> when he had dinners, he would always write them at the bottom of the calendar. So when I saw two entries at the top of the calendar, it was clear he had flown there before the assassination took place. Now, there is a second, uh, and by the way, as soon as I saw this, I knew it was important, and I knew <clears throat> that my friend David Talbot was writing a book on Alan Dulles and the Kennedy assassination, and I thought, well, I want to give it to him. You know, at that point, I had no thought of writing a book of my own, and and I wanted to make sure it surfaced where it would have the most impact. So I gave it to him, and I didn't share it online. Well, that proved to be a huge mistake because. After uh, Talbot's book came out, The Devil's Chessboard, that document disappeared from their website. You couldn't, all those links were gone. You couldn't find anything. And uh, and people were then starting to say, well, it never existed. And David just made that up. And mm -hmm. of course, I knew that wasn't true. And I had showed it to Jim DiEugenio. I showed it to um, David Talbot's researcher, who never gets enough credit. I mean, really, she deserves at least 50% of the credit for The Devil's Chessboard. She researched a ton of that. She found it. She argued, you know, topics with David. She helped him with all his drafts. I mean, it's as much her book as it is his. So there were four of us who had seen this calendar that people were now saying didn't exist. All right. So I actually wrote the Princeton Library and I said, you know, you used to have a calendar of Alan Dulles's and now it's not there. What happened to it? And they wrote me back and said, we never had Alan Dulles's calendar. Wow. Well, I knew that wasn't true. <laughs> and I thought there's a real cover up going on here. So I started posting that on on Twitter. And I had posted an earlier date from his calendar, proving the calendar itself exists. And that was October when Alan Dulles had himself gone to Dallas in 1963, a month before the assassination, you know, for some trade talk, of course, you know, he always had an excuse for everywhere he went, you know, as usually to give a talk somewhere. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And because that one had a link, it it's it's a path that showed that that file at one point really did exist. So one of the other researchers, his name is Robert Morrow, and I don't want to elevate his profile because honestly, I don't. I've always had a bad feeling about him. I think he's an infiltrator in the research community. He tries to browbeat people into believing him on things. But he did go to the Princeton Library and worked with them to kind of resurface that calendar. And now I can find it and I know where to go. You pretty much have to search to find the calendar. There's no direct link that will take you there. But mm -hmm. if you search Alan Dulles's calendar and you find 1961, there is a, a download link there. And when you download it, you get 1961 through 1967. So I recommend people do that if they're interested. Okay, so that's that's the backdrop. And uh, go ahead, Sean, because I know we've talked about several of the dates and entries. Yeah, well, and <laughs> let's start, Lisa, let's start, let's talk about the farm a little bit, because uh, the farm is really a place where there's two main things that are being done there. They're training black operators and running black operations. I mean, Dan Hardaway, who did such a great job with the House, House Select Committee on Assassinations, him and Eddie Lopez, um, he said the farm is like a, an alternate uh, CIA headquarters that Dulles could run operations out of. 
Yes. And Victor Marchetti, Victor Marchetti, who was a CIA officer, he said that, you know, CIA assassins were trained at the farm. So right. um, this is a very important um, operational base. And the right. first question is, how in the hell does Alan <laughs> Dulles have access to this base in 1963 when he's fired by Kennedy? He should exactly. have no access. It goes to show you the power of Alan Dulles that he even has access to this secret facility. Exactly. Kennedy allowed Dulles to retire. I mean, it was obviously a forced retirement, but even so, I mean, if you retire from my company, you turn in your badges, you know, you don't have access to the sure. office anymore. You can't get into the file network. That's common everywhere, except when it's Alan Dulles and the CIA. So that that is extraordinary that he was allowed that access. And I looked through his calendar backwards and forwards, and unfortunately, it was late last night. And I'm pretty sure there was only one other instance where he was at the farm overnight. And I'm pretty sure it was after this and not before this, meaning from 1961 to November 1963, in, unless I'm misremembering where there was one overnight in that period but I'm pretty sure, like I said, it came after that. So it's not like he went to the farm every weekend or something like that, you know. <laughs> and and the farm, like I said, Dallin Dulles is not a farmer. There is only one explanation for that. It can only mean <laughs> exactly. Jeff theory. And, and, and the it, timing yeah. with that weekend is extraordinary. Right. And it's not like he just showed up on some random weekend when there was, you know, nothing going on. I mean, it was the the probably the the biggest, the biggest <laughs> we've ever had in this country exactly now one could argue that he went there after the fact i i find that hard to believe because where he flew in he flew into newport news and if you look at a map again newport news is kind of at the bottom of virginia and williamsburg where he was giving a speech that morning is a little bit north of there and then the camp Peary is kind of like right across the highway from the area where he was giving the speech. It's right across from Williamsburg there. Now, there is a second desk calendar that is typed that to me looks like more of a, how do I want to say, a calendar typed after the fact. For example, on November 22nd, it says there's a call that night that was canceled. You don't normally write a call that's canceled on a forward-looking calendar, right? You write that after the fact, like, oh, I had this call, but we ended up not talking. All right, you know, why would I put on my calendar that I don't need to call this guy? You know, <laughs> that's, that seems weird. Yeah. And so, but on this typed calendar, there's a handwritten note where Alan Dulles supposedly said, with John Warner in DC, 3.30 PM or so, you know, right around the time JFK was shot. So either that's true, and Alan Dulles did go all the way into D.C., possibly to give himself an alibi. This John Warner was not the guy who was the governor and the Nixon administration person. This was a high-level CIA guy that he was with. So uh, either way, to me, it still looks suspicious. So either he's giving himself an alibi on a calendar with another CIA guy to vouch for him, which kind of doesn't make sense, or that was simply written to give him an alibi when in fact he was at the farm the whole time, which makes much more sense because I'm pretty sure that's why he had that Williamsburg talk that morning. In the same way, Clay Shaw in New Orleans, that the guy that Jim Garrison prosecuted for uh, right. being part of the assassination conspiracy, Clay Shaw gave himself an alibi talking at an event in San Francisco. And the guy he called was another CIA contact, Jay Monroe Sullivan. Both of them had the clearance for something called Project QK and Chant, which we can talk about some other time because it's too big a topic for this. Um, I don't believe that the explanation the CIA gave the ARB as to what that project entailed. I think they lied about that. Um, but in any case, you know, both of them were giving talks that morning right before Kennedy was killed. And in Clay Shaw's case, J. Monroe Sullivan, I was just rereading Jim's excellent book, uh, Destiny Betrayed, the second edition, which is updated from his first edition, which was also good. Um, but in the second edition, Monroe Sullivan says, 
you know, Clay Shaw didn't seem the least bit surprised or upset when Kennedy was killed, whereas Monroe Sullivan himself was stunned. You know, I mean, it was just, mm -hmm. it was, you know, took his breath away. And Clay, he asked Clay Shaw, should we continue? And Clay Shaw's like, yes, of course. And, and you know, so Monroe went up and asked for a moment of silence before Clay Shaw spoke. But he was really struck by Clay Shaw's lack of empathy for that. Wow. So... Yeah. But but Lisa, the second calendar um, kind of skips really from the 22nd, goes right to like the 26th, correct? So it doesn't right. really There's say a, exactly. how long he was prove, with John Warner. So Right. And some researchers are trying to say, well, see, he right. went back to D.C., so he probably wasn't at the farm. And I'm like, no. it's only a two hour drive, you know, two and a half hour drive. Right. There are trains, there are planes, there are boats you can take to get from one to the other. So, it, you know, I, I've driven two hours both ways in a day many times so that's not impossible at all um but like i said it could also just be a, a total fabrication and the fact that that calendar has nothing else to the 26 whereas his his desk his uh daily planner kind of thing you know had it three days in a row well right i tend to believe that that's where he was so i i don't think there's any question he was at the farm i think the people who question it should themselves be questioned as to where their ultimate loyalties lie because the, right. the ci research community has been very infiltrated by people with deep ties to the intelligence community and it's funny i just read about another one last night you know there's a guy ken ron and he'd written things that made me assume he was cia but i couldn't prove it until now, because now the CIA is like openly admitted he worked for them. <laughs> it's like, so there are people in the community trying to mislead people, trying to, and not even just those who say it was a low nut. Some of those like Paul Hoke, you know, who's always said it was a conspiracy, but it's like not a CIA conspiracy. Right. You know, there are people sure. like that who try and mislead too. So anyway, so yeah. let's get into this, Lisa. So the 22nd, 23rd and 24th, Dulles is at the farm. Now, when he actually got to the farm in the 22nd is kind of debatable. But the, the fact is, you know, everything that's going on that, you know, Kennedy's assassinated. Oswald is taken into custody. You know, Saturday, he makes that <laughs> right. Well, it's Saturday, he makes that call to hunt in, in North Carolina, an intelligence um, officer. And then right. Sunday, you know, Ruby assassinates Oswald and Dulles is at the farm this entire time while all this is going on. Now, right. one of the important things on the 23rd, he has later in the day at the bottom written John Simpson. Yes. And when so you showed I looked that to me, <laughs> I said to you, I said, who the hell is John Simpson? And yes. of course, you know, you did the research on it and you find out that that Simpson has ties to the Rockefellers, Avery Rockefellers specifically. And the yes. thing I said to you with that is I said, and this is my opinion, you know what Dulles is doing here? This is before the Warren Commission is formed. He's talking to these powerful people like the Rockefellers to get Johnson to put pressure on Lyndon Johnson if, to, if the committee is created to make sure that Dulles is on that committee. And that's exactly what's going to happen in the next few days when the Warren Commission is created. Powerful sources are going to be calling Johnson, putting pressure on him, and Dulles gets on the Warren Commission. So well, why don't you speak I, about what you found about John Simpson? Yeah, and I think I think there's uh, I think what you said is probably part of it, but there's even more to it because it turns out on November 17th, so we're talking five days before the assassination, there's another note in his calendar where he has John, Avery. And it could be any John and any Avery, but Avery's not a common name. And it was Avery Rockefeller that John Simpson was directly involved in. So it does make sense that it might have been those two. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. And again, this ties to Clay Shaw, which is why I mentioned him before. Um, the Henry Schroeder Bank put up the money for Permindex, which was this kind of shadowy operation in Europe that seems to have been involved in the assassination planning of the de Gaulle hits that never quite came off with the disgruntled OAS members. Um, 
There's also something called Operation Gladio in Italy, and Permindex moves to Italy in 58, right when the Gladio operations are starting. Clay Shaw gets involved with that. Frank Nagy, a former um, uh, Hungarian prime minister, is involved in that. Some really big, powerful people are involved in that. Well, the Schroeder Bank was also in the Americas. The, the subsidiary in America was controlled by John Simpson and Ellen Dulles. And in fact, Dulles was general counsel for it at one point in time. Now, Avery Simpson at one point joins in to form the Schroeder Rockefeller Foundation. But it, it could have been because it you know, was linked to some of these shadowy organizations. A year later, Avery Rockefeller comes back and says, take my name off of that. I don't want my name involved in this. And this was a bank that, you know, in its London subsidiary had been funding Hitler and Hitler's operatives during World War II. I mean, these are a bunch of radical right wingers, essentially, who are networking together. So if he's meeting with, if it is that Avery and that John on the 17th, and, you know, making sure maybe that there's money in place, this is pure speculation at this point, but, you know, I... I it's like, is everything in place for the hit in Dallas? You know, do you need any more money? Are the shooters hired? Is everything set? And then I can see Alan debriefing John, who he, he would have been friends with John Simpson since the 40s. I mean, he had known this guy intimately. In fact, there was a document I was reading recently where uh, Simpson used to, or Alan used to go to Simpson's house and throw pebbles at the window to wake him. I mean, they've known each other that long. And so, you know, I don't know where Simpson lived. I don't think he lived in that area near the farm. So I think Simpson came to Dulles and not the other way around. So uh, because the farm is still written that day and the day after. So I think that's super interesting. And it would link Clay Shaw and what he was doing in with Helen Dulles and possibly the hit on Kennedy. I mean, it all starts to connect right there. Absolutely. So, as soon as I saw John Simpson and found out he was involved with Schroeder, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this can this completes the circle. We've been trying to connect, you know, for decades. And to me, right. it's right there in Alan Dulles's calendar. And again, so, that's consistent with Alan Dulles's behavior. You know, yes, to, to... exactly. And now I want to go back to what you said about pressuring LBJ, because there were CI assets presser, pressuring LBJ to set up right. what eventually became called inaccurately the the Warren Commission. We all know it should have been called the Dulles, the Dulles Commission because yeah. he was there the most. Oh, yeah. um, right. But uh, in the calendar earlier in the year and, and several times, because I again, I reread from 1961 forward, he meets frequently with Joe Alsop. Joe Alsop was a gay guy who was married. You know, he's trying to keep his gayness hidden. And for that reason, people wondered if he could have been blackmailed into serving the CIA. But Alsop became very open about it in later years. He's like, no, I love the CIA. I believed in everything they were doing. I didn't need to be blackmailed to help them. I wanted to help them. And he, at one point, was caught putting a CIA press release in the New York Times as if it was an article written by himself. <laughs> I mean, this didn't come out until basically, you know, the church committee and the Pike committee started looking into the press's relationship with the CIA. But Alsop is on the phone within, you know, hours to LBJ saying, you need a presidential commission and you need, you know, people who can keep the secrets and we don't want to get World War III started and, you know, kind of laying out the whole scenario. And the other person who calls LBJ and gives that same sort of speech is Eugene Rostow, whose brother Walt Rostow is a high-level CIA official. So, you know, you have two CIA guys basically landing on, on President Johnson, you know, moments after Kennedy has been killed, telling him, don't let the FBI do this. Don't let local authorities do this. You need a presidential commission that we can control, you know, right? Being the right. secret message. Right. And and then Lisa, so then let's let's go into some of these other uh, really interesting uh, dates that he has on his calendar here. So, following assassination, um, the twenty fifth and twenty sixth, it looks like he's meeting with a lot of media assets. Or or right before actually, because the the twenty fifth and twenty sixth, he's still at the farm, and I didn't see anything. But literally, like I think it was the twentieth 
or the 21st even, he's meeting with the Boston press. Boston, yeah. And the 21st, two, two he met with Boston. Two different organizations, a, a TV station and a, and a news organization. Right. In, and, and of course, Boston is where the Kennedys are from. And they right. know the Kennedy family well, and they might have some sympathy and want to know who killed Kennedy. And frankly, the whole year 1963, Alan Dulles is making his rounds with the media. He had a really close relationship with CBS. He was friends mm -hmm. with uh, Polly, who owned the place. And uh, and he used to stage a dinner every year where the top CBS executives and people like Walter Cronkite and all those, you know, the top faces of the news would come and he would sit them like interspersed with high level CIA people so they could get to know them and socialize with them and make contacts. And it was all so friendly and innocent. Ha ha ha. You know, and and then who is kind of the biggest voice on the media after the assassination, but CBS with Walter Cronkite getting the news first and Kennedy was right. killed, you know, 16 minutes ago or whatever he says. Right. And then Dan Rather gets to see the Zapruder film and misreports it and said he saw yeah. Kennedy's head go violently forward when we've all now seen the film and the the head goes violently back and to the left. And, and they're all so forward. There were also articles, Lisa, that had been published in newspapers, uh, even like around the world. I, I know that there was like, wasn't there a newspaper in New Zealand that had published the article about uh, Lee Harvey Oswald? Lee Harvey Oswald yes. before they had even charged him, right? I mean, that's that's insane. Yeah, I yeah, I'm not. Uh, I've looked into that a little bit, and there might be a confusion on the time and the time difference and stuff. Right. But okay. it was still super early, and all the stories about Oswald were incredibly complete at first glance, even yeah. though Oswald had literally only been in the media once or twice before, certainly only in the national media once before when he defected, right. and then in the local New Orleans media, and the the people that. Um, Seth Cantor noticed because Seth Cantor was a local Dallas reporter and he got his data from a guy named Hal Hendrick. I can't even say Hal Hendricks in Miami, Florida. Hendricks was known as the spook at his own media organization because he had such deep ties to the CIA. In fact, Hendricks reported on a coup against Trujillo the day before it happened. Now, how could that be? Oh. <laughs> Wow. It's like he had written it up and sent it to his editor and they forgot to hold it till yeah, the right. great time and just ran with it. So it's like, that's how connected Hendrix was. Now, Seth Cantor had talked to Hendrix and later when the House Select Committee, you know, was releasing the records of the, you know, the various reporters and stuff, he noticed that his call to Hendrix had been excised from his own notes. And he's like, why would they take that out? Well, of course, they're trying to hide their own CIA media asset. Hal Hendricks was a very close friend of David Atlee Phillips, who, you know, has his fingerprints all over the early press coverage of the JFK assassination, and who, in later years, Vessiana accused of meeting with Oswald and said, you know, he saw them together. Um more more recently, several researchers, including Dan Hardway, who I truly respect, doesn't believe Vessiana and thinks he's now making that up. And maybe he is, maybe he isn't. I, I really don't know. I haven't looked into that in any depth. But it is clear that David Phillips was deeply involved in the first day stories and the propaganda. And it's also clear that David Phillips was probably connected with Clay Shaw, through a company called Freeport Sulphur, which mm -hmm. had a nickel mine in Cuba that um, Castro had seized. And one of the Freeport Sulphur executives wanted to kill Castro and Clay Shaw was helping him and flew with him to Montreal, Canada. Interestingly enough, uh, Montreal seems to be a CI nexus in the same way that uh, Mexico City is a CI right. nexus where <laughs> spies spy on each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, gun and of course, and Phillips drugs. Phillips lied about Mexico City, about Oswald's trip to Mexico City. He lied over and over on that one. Yes, yes, he did. Yeah, Phillips, and and when Phillips was himself questioned, he smoked like three cigarettes at the same time because he yeah, was so he was nervous, nervous right. and so <laughs> right. you know, Innocent people don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <No. I think. laughs> 
so, so yeah, he had a lot to hide. And and then there's his own brother had suspected right. David Phillips of being involved and basically got a deathbed confession out of him and said, yes. were you in Dallas the day, you know, John Kennedy was killed? And David Phillips told his brother, yes. Wow. And that was like as wow. much as he would say about it. And then he died shortly right. after. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's dive into some more of these dates, Lisa. And and okay. I want the, the listeners to keep this in mind because we just had Professor Paul Blow on and we talked about the prior plots to kill Kennedy. So the plot in Chicago was was on November 2nd. The plot in Tampa was November 18th. You also had plots in San Antonio, Nashville, D.C., Los Angeles. So keep those dates in mind, you know, the 2nd and the 18th of November when we go through some of these dates because – I think there could be a tie-in in a lot of these. So we have, mm-hmm. you talked about Joe, Joe Alsop. Uh, Dulles meets with him on November 9th. Right. Um, you know, right. he also, on the 13th, he's meeting with uh, Prager. Uh, yes, Frederick House. Prager. Yeah, yeah. Frederick Prager was one of the CIA's media assets, one of the acknowledged open media assets who ran a, a book publishing company. And the CIA has often used published books as a way to promote their agenda and put misinformation out there and, you know, or or rebut other people's information, true or false, that goes against the agency. So, yes. Okay. Who else? Yes. (laughs) Well, we got, um, you know, we talked about November 21st. He he meets with the Boston TV and then he meets with CBS. Um, That's so interesting. Now let's yes. go. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to September. We got September twentieth. He meets with Cord Meyer and James Angleton. Now, yes, Richard Case <laughs> Nagel. Yeah, I mean, Richard Case <laughs> Nagel thought a plot to kill JFK was going down in D.C. sometime about here. But here's the point, Lisa. Why is Dulles meeting with Cord Meyer and James Angleton, two high-ranking CIA officials, when Dulles don't have a job? He's not a CIA official at this point. What is <laughs> exactly. he doing meeting with these exactly. two guys? <laughs> They're just catching up, right? They're just having yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, he is meeting with all kinds of high level. Richard Helms is a frequent visitor before the assassination. He's an even more frequent visitor after the assassination because, you know, Alan Dulles is getting the CIA's version of events from Helms now. You know, what do they know inside the agency and what do they want to share with the Warren Commission? Um, yeah. And Richard Case Nagel had literally gone into a bank shot at the ceiling, not at a person, and sat down and waited to be arrested and said something like, I'm safer in jail. I don't want to be in, you know, in Dallas or whatever. He he never actually said Dallas, but there were other prisoners that he told that the reason he shot up the bank was he wanted to be in jail. So he wasn't part of a plot to kill Kennedy. And that's pretty astonishing. It's like, if you figure that you're going to be set up. And he had befriended Oswald and supposedly he had a tape of the conspirators, um, one of whose name was Angel. And usually with the Cubans, that's their middle name is the name that they're mm-hmm. known by, the the mate, the female, that's just the way the names are there. So somebody in hell, maybe Louis Angel Castillo, you know, <laughs> you know, there are all kinds of interesting people who might have been involved, but supposedly had a tape of him and another guy planning the assassination. And, and then Nagel is wet, ready to talk to the investigators when the ARB is set up in the 1990s, the Assassination Records Review Board. And then, of course, Nagel is killed at his home shortly uh, before that. So, or dies, but I right. think killed, given that he literally just promised to talk and then boom, he's dead. So there, there's a real pattern Lisa, with people. <laughs> yeah. Just those those two names, though, Cord Meyer and James Angleton. I mean, they're just in the middle of everything. And, and yeah, so James Angleton. Meeting them. Yeah, James Angleton is is was t- for 25 years the head of the CIA's counterintelligence. James Angleton knew all about Oswald because his group, he had set up within the big counterintelligence group, which was like 200 people at CIA. He also had a small like black ops group within counterintelligence. And that's where Oswald's file was. Yeah, yeah. SIG, Special Investigations Group. They did mole hunting, 
but they also probably did other operations. But that's where Oswald's file was. And when files came in, people knew to route it there. So it's like Oswald was known to be one of these this tiny group of people that Angleton was like personally interested in. Now, a few months before the assassination, Angleton hands Oswald off his file and everything to Des Fitzgerald, who now runs the special affairs staff. And Des got his job when Bill Harvey was <laughs> essentially fired after having pissed off Robert Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Bill Harvey is, is literally sending 10 infiltration teams into Cuba during the crisis. And Bill Harvey wants to kill Castro. Right. And Bobby finds out about it and he is furious. And he's like, I'm going to give you two minutes you know, to explain this to me. And and Bill Harvey is talking as fast as he can, and, and Bobby just walks out, and CIA realizes Bill Harvey is basically dead to the Kennedys. They will never believe him or listen to him again. And so instead of firing them, which is what Bobby had asked for, they transferred him to Italy, where Permindex is, Rome. where, where Rome. mafia people are, where <laughs> French assassins are. And then who shows up later in Dealey Plaza? Some mafia people, some French assassins, you know, some, and Bill Harvey right. himself appears to have been in Dallas that day. Bill Harvey, David Atlee Phillips, these are big guys. David Atlee Phillips went on to be the number three guy in the CIA, right. the head of the entire Western Hemisphere yeah. Division. That's huge. That's all of the Americas, North, South, Middle. It's, you know, that was huge. So uh, these these were the trusted guys. And uh, Bill Harvey. Well, Lisa, it's, his... it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that you mentioned the name Des Fitzgerald, because guess who Dulles meets with on September 28th? Des Fitzgerald. <laughs> Des Fitzgerald. I and mean, when I saw it's, that. It, it's unbelievable. <laughs> So when I saw that, you know, you know, I sent you a message and a picture of that page. You and did. I'm like, was he asking Des, why didn't the DC plot come off? You know, because remember, right. Miguel was trying to avoid a plot that he thought was going to happen in DC. There's some Oswald link to it. And I couldn't find it in time for this broadcast. But years ago, I had looked into that. And there was something about Oswald either being in DC at that time or somebody sending you know, guns to him there or something. And I don't remember. It's been a long time since I looked into that. I mean, it's been at least 20 years since I looked into that. But there was some Oswald DC September connection. And I thought, so that was super interesting to me that of all people, he meets with Des Fitzgerald, who's basically now running assassination plots against Castro, any one of which could have been turned and used against Kennedy. Sure. I mean, it's amazing how all this pieces are fitting in the puzzle here with Dallas's calendar. It really is like, so then on October 10th, he's got, uh, he meets with Sam Papich and Frank Wisner. Yes. Um, yeah. I was surprised that he met with Wisner a few times leading up to the assassination too. And Wisner had had a breakdown in 1958. Wisner used right. to be Dallas. You know, he used to be the guy who sure. ran all the plots, all the assassinations and then Wisner was succeeded by Harvey, who was succeeded by Des Fitzgerald. Um, if I have that right, I feel like Helms was in there somewhere before he became CI director. After Allen was, re well, yeah, it was before that. Anyway, uh, Wisner was the guy who ran what they call Wisner's Wurlitzer, the the CIA's media operations. You know, it was Wisner who first built a lot of those relationships with ABC and CBS and NBC and the only three networks we had when we were growing up, at least when I was growing up. Oh, yeah. You know, now people have what they perceive to be hundreds of outlets that are still only owned by five companies in the entire planet. You know, it's really sad that we have the illusion of diversity, but not actual diversity in the media. Um, yeah, so he's meeting with Wisner. And, and what was the other name? Sorry, because I'm not looking at the calendar right now. Uh, Sam Papich. Oh, yeah, Sam Papich. So again, he had talked to Angleton, who's very powerful, um, knew all about Oswald. Sam Papich was the liaison between Hoover and Angleton, basically. So he was like the counterintelligence liaison between what the FBI was doing, and what the CIA was doing. And I looked into Papich a lot early on. It's like, where were his real loyalties 
And there were many times where Papage is like, this is too sensitive. I'm not going to share this with Hoover. So Papage to me has always been more CIA than FBI, which is why Angleton trusted him so much. So yeah, it's like, you know, somebody took Oswald off the watch list at FBI because his profile had been raised by some documents, his trip to Mexico City in October and that would be the point where the volume on Oswald Alert should have been turned up, but instead it was turned down at right. FBI and literally taken off a watch list. Maybe Alan Dulles asked Pappage to talk to somebody at FBI to make that happen. I think it was Marvin Giesling might have been the one at FBI who, who removed him. Um, it's just, you know, we can only speculate, obviously, about what the conversations were but the timing is interesting because again early october is right after the supposed mexico city trip with angleton right. and interestingly enough the cia they sent two memos within the same two hours by the same people that said two totally different things one completely misdescribed oswald as older fat and balding and you know that the cia didn't have any information on him and I mean, it's just completely false crap. That went to the major agencies in the U.S. But in Florida, where the legat, the legal attache uh, for the FBI at the embassy, um, who was working with the CIA, and I forget his name, but that guy got like the actual description of Oswald. And I thought that was so interesting. It's like, so the CIA trusted the people around Mexico City with the real facts, but to the rest of the agencies and the government. Now, the CIA claims the reason they do this is, oh, there's a third party rule and you can't share information, you know, that you got with one age from one agency to another. And so it was okay to share the Mexico information with the Mexican, you know, intelligence officials there, but it wasn't okay to share it. But I'm like, that doesn't mean you have to then send a knowing lie. You could just not send them information. But to send an actual lie, it was as if the CIA was trying to raise the threat profile on um, Oswald, his name, but not in a way that could get him picked up before the assassination, because he was the key patsy. I mean, you can't, if you got rid of him, they would have been scrambling because they had set up this huge legend. He'd gone to the Soviet Union ostensibly as a defector, and then they had him in Mexico City, even though I don't think Oswald went to Mexico City at that time. I'm pretty sure that was an imposter that entire trip. Um, and some of those right. conversations were literally faked wholesale. One of them that couldn't have happened at the Soviet embassy because they were closed that day. <laughs> right. You know, is it, and I'm pretty sure David Phillips helped craft that fake conversation. But, but you know, they invested a lot in setting up this guy as like a communist sympathizer killing Kennedy which is hilarious because, of course, the reason they killed Kennedy, they thought he was too communistic. <laughs> so right, but they're that's, trying that's to not consistent. only take down Kennedy, but take down any leftists who might have sympathized from that angle. <laughs> and that's right out of the Harvey playbook where, you, you know, you kill one enemy and blame another. Right, right, right. It's not just the Harvey playbook. I mean, that's that's CIA's modus operandi. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so here's another interesting date, Lisa. This is fascinating. October 2nd, uh, 1963, he meets with Doug Dillon, um, Secretary of the Treasury, which is, of course, in charge of the Secret Service. And he also has bank bank reps uh, there. Now, Dillon would have an alibi because he would be out of the country when this whole thing went down. And he faces very little blowback after this as you know, head of the Secret Service, he should have been really, you know, right over, over the coals. coals. This, the not, entire you know, this, cabinet was out of the country, right, Sean? Um, there there was a lot of them in in Hawaii, right, Lisa? They were coming back from yeah, Japan. Yeah, I don't remember if Dylan was I don't in know. the Hawaii group or not. But in any case, yeah, Douglas, uh, here's the most thing. of the cabinet was. Yeah. yeah. There were people on the grassy knoll because the witnesses, if you read like the, the original L.A., I mean, uh, Dallas police reports, there are like 100 people who said the shots came from the grassy knoll. I mean, this right. is not a secret in Dallas, you know. And when people ran up there, though, there were some guys posing as Secret Service who were not actual Secret Service, but who flashed Secret Service credentials. 
And it's been known that the CIA uses the Secret Service as cover. So the relationship between Douglas Dillon and Allen is especially interesting. And again, especially given the timing, October 2nd is like the day Oswald returned or something, or October 1st, maybe supposedly came back from Mexico City. So I, and to me, the whole point of that fake trip to Mexico City was to set up Oswald for the assassination. I, sure. I think it's hard to read that any other way. They were painting what they call a legend, a false intelligence tale to explain, you know, to lay in the cover story in advance of the crime. Right. And and one of those people, at least it was a was a cop, I believe uh, Marshall Smith was his name. And he he testified in a Warren commission that he ran up the knoll and he stopped the guy and the guy gave him credentials of Secret Service. But he he felt really bad about it afterwards because he said there's something was off about the guy. And yeah, he was right, because it was there was no Secret there was Service no on secret the ground service on the knoll. Exactly. They were all with the cars. So. Right. Yeah. And again, it's like, how does this stuff not make it into the mainstream media? I was literally on a show with a woman, Kim Iverson. At the end of her show, she's like, how is the fact? And she put it as fact that the CIA killed a sitting president, not the biggest story in our country. And I think she's exactly right. It's like the facts were right there. And the only reason we never got the truth was the CIA's deep relationships with all these media people. And it'd be so easy to go to them right. and it's like, oh, you know, it was really the Soviets and we don't want World War Three. We just escaped a nuclear crisis, you know, a few months ago in uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. We don't want to go up against the Soviets. you got to keep all this conspiracy evidence out of the paper. Not telling them, of course, it's really us who killed Kennedy. Right. You know, it's it's such an easy way to convince the media people who certainly don't want to believe that the CIA that they've been trusting and working with was behind the assassination. I think people's capacity for self denial is pretty great. You know, <laughs> I think we all you know have that capacity to ignore facts right in front of our face when they don't tell us a comfortable truth. Yeah, I think half the country's going through that right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> more than half. <laughs> well, Lisa, I mean, a lot of the investigations, I mean, you had the church committee, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, the, the Jim Garrison investigation, the ARB, all of them point to some type of conspiracy, except for the Warren Commission. And this is the only one that's really reported <laughs> in the mainstream is the Warren right. Commission. And, and that's, again, that's shocking. Although, how do I want to say it? The HSCA, they did claim that their basis for saying conspiracy was in large part, the sound evidence you right. know, that there appeared, and they referred it to the National Academy of Sciences for further investigation. Well, the NAS is just another government agency, meaning the CIA has control over that because the CIA has basically captured every agency of this government to some level. I mean, they made a point of that early on. They wanted to know everything going on everywhere. You'd think they were busy spying on foreign countries. Their first job was to spy on everybody at home to make sure that they kept their jobs, you know, to make sure the CIA existed. And uh, and so, of course, the NAS said, oh, no, we reinvestigated the sound. There was no thing. There were no shots from the null, which is exactly what I'd expect a government agency to find, which sure, is why the, the HSCA made a point of hiring an independent, not government connected, you know, group of scientists to determine right. that shots did come from elsewhere. What, was there an audio recording? Yes, there was a dick yeah. about recording. Um, one of oh, the okay. cops in Dealey Plaza, his microphone was stuck on. So there literally was a recording oh, of wow. the shots in Dealey Plaza. And so they did like echo analysis and they shot and recorded, you know, various combinations of where the shots came from and determined that at least one of the shots came from the grassy knoll based on the sound profiles. Right, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I know. Very. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, no, and, and the media is bad and the historians are bad. And this is something else that's rarely talked about. The CIA has infiltrated academia. And right. they have- and We talked about that, Lisa, with yes. Professor Blow. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And they've had longstanding programs. There's an excellent book on that. It's by Christopher Simpson, who's the same guy who wrote Blowback about Operation Paperclip. 
And he wrote um, a book called The Science of Coercion, which is excellent. But he also wrote one, I think it's just called Colleges and Universities or something. But uh, I think it was The Science of Coercion that taught me more about the infiltration of academia. And that, again, came out during the Church Committee and the Pike Committee, but was not widely reported. But George Orwell, you know, who was really Eric Blair, Orwell was the pen name of Eric Blair, and Eric Blair was an intelligence agent. And when he wrote in the, the novel that was originally going to be named 1948, and his publisher convinced him to name 1984, so as not to scare people since it was coming out in like 1948, <laughs> was... Uh, uh, who controls the past controls the future and who controls the present controls the past. Mm. No one understood that better than the CIA. It's like, we want our narrative out there. You know, we want to control the world. And if we can get everybody to say we didn't do it, that Oswald did it alone and we enforce that, then we remain in control. If our hand is exposed, you know, we might go away entirely <laughs> And, you know, who wants that, right? No one in the CIA is going to want their agency to go down. Now, here's the thing. At the time when all this had happened, of course, all the conspirators were still alive. So I could really see why the CIA would go to great lengths to cover it up. But now everybody who was involved is dead. I mean, right. you know, I'm sure even the, the longest lived conspirator must be dead by now. Right. So now it's like, to me, this is, this should be soul searching time at the CIA. It's like, if we continue to persist in this lie, we are going to destroy this country. We almost did because so many people don't believe us anymore. They elected Trump. You know, I mean, literally, it's the lies of this country that helped Trump get elected. When he called out fake media, that rang true to a lot of people, you know, for all the wrong reasons in the most case. But there was truth in that. The media has been fake on the Kennedy assassination and fake on, you know, a, a variety of uh, scandals. We all saw the WMD from the New York Times. We have to go to, you know... Iraq and stop WMD, and then there were no WMD there. We blew up a whole country, even yeah. though they never attacked us and weren't developing weapons just so we could get their oil and so we could get a foothold on the border of Iran, which was our ultimate target and probably still is. Um, so it's like the, the CI really, if they come clean, if they say, look, we had some really bad actors in our early days, they did this. But we have to come clean because the country we're here to defend and protect ostensibly is literally not going to survive this. It's like the lies are literally pushing our country over the edge right now. We are so close to utter fascism. And if we don't tell the truth, I don't see that we have any other way forward. And, and Lisa, that's really when, when you talk to naysayers, the pe people who who doubt you know, that there was any conspiracy, I don't know how you could at this point, but people who still say, you know, if there was a conspiracy, how come, you know, how come no one ever came forward? How come? And, you know, you say, well, people have come forward, but, you know, it's, there's never been like a 60 minutes on, you know, right. okay, here's the director of the CIA saying, yes, this is what happened. And, and yes, Oswald was a patsy. And yes, we did, you know, organize everything. And there were these plots and all that. That's never happened. And I think that's what people are waiting for. Then no one's going to believe it. Not no one. Right. But, you right. Know, the, you know, these the doubters, the the people who just don't will never accept that there was a conspiracy yeah, then, until MSNBC reports it. Exactly. It exactly. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, I, I wonder why that that hasn't happened. And it certainly doesn't seem to be any any indication that it's going to happen anytime soon. No. And, and like I said, and I think that's a mistake because I think the American right. public we would just have know. great faith in a CIA that would admit the failures of its past. Sure. The, and we the public has know. zero faith in an agency that's still lying about something that happened more than 60 years ago that we now have so many documents. It's just, it's, it's ridiculous how much evidence we have that the CIA killed Kennedy. It's ridiculous that people are still denying it. Historians are not looking at this. I, I think I told the story on here before about a friend of mine who wanted to get a master's 
do his master's thesis on the JFK assassination and was told, if you do that, no one here will help you. Not one person here will help you. And you probably won't get your master's degree. I mean, this is a historical event right. sure that it deserves is. a historical It's a coup d'etat in our country. And, and exactly. uh, that's what they don't want out. That's what right. they don't yeah. want out. Right. Yeah. Speaking of that, Lisa, speaking of, you know, infiltrating academia, you had mentioned earlier that Princeton said Princeton had had gone to you and said, "Hey, we never had this date book in our." Have they talk about gaslighting? <laughs> have they ever come back to you and said, "You know what? We made a mistake." Or no, never, nope. never. Nope. No. Nope. And you know, if that guy hadn't tracked down the records or whatever, they might have been denying they had it to this day. Yeah. So, and it could have been an innocent mistake. It could have been somebody who really just didn't know any better. I mean, you right. know, I'm always going to give people the benefit of the doubt. But in that but, case, they would have come but, back and said, you know what, that was a mistake. We did have it. And, you know, yeah. but, but the way they've organized their website now, it's like literally you have to search to find anything. Right. You can't, in the past, you could literally browse all the Alan Dulles records, they were easily visible. And now it's much more difficult to find yeah. it. Yeah. That can't be an accident. Of course you not. Know? Yeah. People don't design websites badly on purpose, right. usually unless they're trying to hide something. Yeah. And Princeton, I mean, Dulles had been meeting with Princeton execs ever since he was fired. I mean, you know, Princeton is one of the CIA's breeding grounds. A lot of these Ivy League college are CIA breeding grounds because they want smart people who can lie well. <laughs> and intelligent people lie better than dumb people do, right? You know, or uneducated people sure, don't lie that well. Right. That's why white collar criminals tend to get away with stuff because they're yep. really good liars. Yeah, right. Yeah, sadly. <laughs> so... Let's get back to the to the day calendar. So October twenty seventh, October twenty eighth, Dulles is in Fort Worth in Dallas. I mean, yeah. that's <laughs> I mean, yeah, again, we're literally and... less than a month before the assassination of Kennedy, and here Dulles is in Dallas, and of course he has a great alibi. I forget what was it, Lisa. Was it a book signing or what was he on? He was I, I think it was another one of the CFR talks or something. You know, one right. of his. You know, he was always going around giving talks, uh, you know, to various foreign policy. I think it was just the FPA, the Foreign Policy Association of Dallas or something like that. But of course, you know, Cabal, Cabal uh, the guy who worked on the Bay of Pigs with Bissell right. was the brother of the guy who was running Dallas, who we now Mayor. know was also CIA. Charles, Charles, Mayor, right, yeah. Charles Cabal, yeah. Exactly. Right. And so you can't help but wonder, did Alan drop a word in his, you know, we don't know. And and by the way, the calendars are censored. I mean, the stuff that we're seeing is the stuff they didn't want to censor. But it says, right, you know, when you start the calendar that CIA staff went through the calendar. And there are some redactions in the calendar. There are some blacked out things. It's it's interesting that no one thought to black out the farm. And maybe they thought, oh, people won't even know what that is. Right. You know, and it looks innocent. But of course, we know what the farm is. And it doesn't look innocent. But yeah, end of October. And yeah, anyway, go ahead. So I, I, well, I find, again, the timing is super interesting. Because if you kind of want to scope out the scene yourself, because by then there must be a plot in place. And oh, I'm sure. sure, you know, I'd, I'd love to know if, if Dulles walked around Dilly Plaza. Oh, I'm sure he did with that that pipe. He probably looked up yeah. at, the, <laughs> at the book depository and said, yeah, that would be a perfect place right there. You know, I could just exactly. see doing that. And, <laughs> and remember, at that point, you're only a week out really from the Chicago plot. So does any of those characters in Dallas connect to Chicago? Um, you know, th there's that angle there you don't know about. It. But one one there was I wanna... Homer Echeverria um yes was arrested, I think with a rifle, a room full of rifles or something in Chicago, because there were basically those two plots in Chicago right. as right. Professor Blow talked about. But I remember years ago a document where I think it was Homer Echeverria was literally pushed out an airplane into the Pacific to drown, you know, basically, or or killed and then pushed out the airplane or something. But, you know, there it maybe it was a different Homer Echeverria, you know, none of these names are completely unique. All right? right. But that name just stuck in my head ever since I saw that document. Cause it's like, wow, that's how the CIA can get rid of people permanently. <laughs> it's like kill them and throw them to the sharks, man. You know, wow. One of the meetings that um, 
David Talbot has in his book, there was a memo that Dulles met with um, Army General Lucius Clay, who we know had such bitter difference with Kennedy in Berlin, the Berlin Wall right. Crisis. And they really escalated that almost to the brink of nuclear war. And um, yes. he also met with this guy, uh, Sierra Martinez, which has ties to Chicago, has ties to Miami, where there was plots That's in both plot of those cities. Yes. You know, and he and Dulles meets with them. And what in the world is, you know, Clay and Dulles doing meeting with this guy who I, I look through a lot of the files, even the CIA files on him, Lisa. This guy's an assassin. I mean, there's no doubt about it. He was a Batista assassin. He's connected mm -hmm. to really hardcore right wing anti Castro groups. And, and you know, here Dulles is meeting with him. And you have to wonder, you know, with his ties to Chicago and his ties to Miami, was he the, the guy running both of those plots in those cities down there? And, you know, and we, so we can only speculate, but it is really interesting. And he's the only such guy who does appear in all three cities stories. Right. So, although what the hell is I, I don't know. Talking about? Yeah, exactly. So, and I, I don't know where Lucius Clay, what his position was at the time he met with Dallas in 63. Was he still I with think the he, army? No, I think he was retired, but it wasn't he with yeah, a defense contractor too. or something? He was that he that a, would make sense. That would make sense. Yeah. yeah. He was still yeah. involved in the circle. Let's put it that way. He yeah. he was still, yeah. you know. Yeah. And go ahead, Billy. You want to say something? No, I did. Actually, I did. I, I have a I have a question. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there's an answer. If you guys can answer, if anyone could, you guys could. Um, I mean, we obviously we know about the the prior plots. And then we know, you know, ultimately he wasn't going to to get out of Dallas alive, right? There was no way. But is there any evidence of um, a future plot? So anything that you know that would have come after Dallas? If I think Lisa was wasn't the San Antonio plot scheduled for the twenty fifth. That I, I don't remember. We, yeah, that I don't yeah. Remember. I think I yeah. seen that the twenty fifth. Um, it was a San Antonio because I think that's when Kennedy was scheduled to to visit San yes. Antonio. Yeah, I was gonna say it would have obviously have to have been something planned on Kennedy's calendar, but yeah, yeah. I, and that's that's the thing too. A lot of people are like, oh, you know, how could all these things just happen to come together in Dallas? You know, so many things had to go right. Even Alan Dulles said that. Yeah, in his own <laughs> oral history interview. Right, but and he sounds like he's bragging he's about like, it. If any one thing had gone wrong, you know, <laughs> this. You know, the plot couldn't have gone off, you know, but it's, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's like he's bragging, like, boy, we thought of everything. <laughs> yeah. And you don't know, you don't know if there was other teams, you know, possibly, and this is speculating, but maybe at the trademark, because he was going to the trademark afterwards, right, Lisa? Exactly, exactly. Well, there's a weird photo. As the car is leaving Dealey Plaza, you know, on route to the hospital, and he's the car has just come through the underpass and just the other side of the underpass, there's a little grassy slope. And there look like three or four like Annie Castro Cubans there hanging out on the other side. Like if the car had made it that far, they might have shot him as he was coming through the underpass. Wow. So, yeah, it's. As he wasn't making it out of Texas. Let's should, put it that way. No, yeah, no way. He wasn't making it out. No way. Yeah, because it was getting close. You know, it's like they, you know, the election was the following yeah. year. They wanted to take him out in time to get LBJ in so that he would yeah. already be in place for the next election. Yes. Right. Because they knew LBJ would continue to support their policies. Interestingly enough, though, I, LBJ would not let them go after Castro in Cuba, which I thought was so interesting because he did let them do whatever they want in Vietnam, but he kept them away from Castro. And, you know, I guess God bless him for that because we don't need any more blood on our hands that we already have. Why do you think that was, Lisa? Why do you think he he went that direction? Do you have any theories? I really don't. I, I think maybe, I mean, he did think the CIA had killed Kennedy. He told his top sure. aide, Marvin Watson, that maybe he feared... I don't know. I really don't know. And what's interesting, Maybe he Lisa, thought it was a waste of money. You know, I mean, because it was small. It was really no threat. They weren't exporting their revolution. Right. 
Whereas Vietnam was at least tied to the rest of Asia, you know, and would have given the communists, well, and did (laughs) give them a foothold there, even though, I mean, to me, that was pretty small potatoes, too, in the big scheme of things. And in the end, they went capitalist. You know, it's like, but an interesting if we thing leave on, these nations alone, nothing bad happens. Right. <laughs> an interesting thing on Johnson is, you know, we know he was so scared of World War III when this stuff was coming out, possibly linking Oswald to, to Coast to Cove and the, the Russians and the Cubans. And he, he wanted to avoid, you know, a nuclear war. And he he went, you know, he he basically browbeat uh, war in, 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 I believe, um, uh, Russell into, you know, being on the commission by using that, oh, you know, 20 million Americans are going to get killed. It's going to be a nuclear war. Right. But when right. the Cuban Missile Crisis was going on and he was vice president, he was literally, you know, advising Kennedy to to, to attack involved. Moscow, you know, and escalate yeah. it. You know, yeah. so what a hypocrite when he's not the guy pulling the trigger. Right. You know, he, it's easy he's, to he's say all this. for it. But when he's he's the guy that's sitting in the seat, he didn't want a nuclear war, you know. I, and I but think had, that, that could be why he didn't want to kill Castro. He probably knew that would bring a Russian sure. attack. And uh, he, but he, he had no scared. problem escalating Vietnam, though. Yeah, because that was further away. If Russia was going to attack, you know, right. they would have attacked in Vietnam first, right? You know, if they attack from Cuba, that's right on our shores, practically 80, 90 right. miles off of Florida. Miles, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, I want that embargo to end. I really want to go to Cuba. (laughs) And I want to be able to go without having to sneak in and out. (laughs) Yeah. I I agree, Lisa. But um, so I know we've taken up a lot of time here. uh, But I got one more important date that this is this is fascinating. October 31st, 1967. Dulles meets with Bill Harvey. And and. Me and you and this was about one this. day after. So I actually wrote about, I wrote about in my book about Harvey meeting with Helms, but I did not know at the time I wrote my book that Harvey had met with Dulles the day after. Because Harvey had met with Helms in 1967 because uh, Johnny Roselli, who the CIA supposedly had been using in their Castro assassination plots and who's always been kind of peripherally linked to the Dallas plot, Johnny Rosali goes to Helms and says, Harvey's in trouble. You know, this card cheating, gambling scandal in Beverly Hills. He got caught with a drilled hole, you know, cheating at cards with big time, you know, Hollywood people. And uh, Johnny Rosali was asking the CIA kind of to help defend him in court from this charge and the implication. And Harvey was a lawyer. Bill Harvey was a lawyer and he was representing him and Helms is like I will not be blackmailed by Bill Harvey so the day after he meets with Helms who basically said no we're not going to help he then meets with Alan Dulles and it's not like they were buddy buddy friends you know it's like the, those those two were kind of from different worlds Bill Harvey is more the the cowboy shoot him up cop on the street kind of character whereas bill alan dulles was more the rich elite you know so these two aren't natural friends but it's clear that he went to alan dulles with probably the same request roselli's going to tell what he knows about what happened in dallas if we don't protect him and this goes on for a few more months and finally the cia gives in and they offer to you know help shield roselli in his case and, you know, as we all know, Roselli then later is approached by the House Select Committee on Assassinations. I mean, uh, the Church Committee, because this was 75. Right. It was the Church Committee. And then he shows up, you know, dead in pieces in a lead barrel in the ocean. Yeah. Right. So it's right. like he and, and knew I, something. And whatever he knew was enough to blackmail the CIA, which is exactly why I think the CIA had, for the most part, avoided doing business with the mob because this is what they feared, you know, that there would be some blackmail and a price to pay down the line and forever after. And so I think they finally took him out, you know, so they didn't have to do it. I think, them. you know, we, we have to stop looking at Roselli as strictly just a mob guy, because I think he yes. was as much a CIA contract guy as he was a mob guy. I, I mean, totally agree. And, and, more, and so is, more so. Johnny Roselli yeah. was so important to the, to the CIA because he really wasn't one of these mob just, you know, killers. Johnny Roselli yeah. was more like a mob ambassador. He he had connections to Hollywood. <laughs> he had connections to, to Vegas. And he was more of a guy like, like, let's just example say, you know, if Carlos Marcello down in New Orleans or Santo Traficante in Florida 
wanted to start a, a casino in Vegas, they would go, they would have to get approval from the outfit in Chicago and from New York, the commission in New York. Now, Johnny Roselli would be that guy that they would go to because he would have the the say, he would have the ability to talk to Tony Accardo in Chicago and the, the bosses in New York, probably through Meyer Lansky. And he would sit down with them two bosses and along with Jimmy Hoffa, whatever, mm-hmm. get money from the Teamsters. And then they would, would work out a deal. And this, to me, a guy like that is so valuable to the CIA. He's way more valuable than a guy who's just a trigger man because CIA is exactly. not a trigger man. So exactly. we got to stop looking at Roselli as a mob guy. Roselli, and, and I'm convinced, Lisa, and, and you might disagree with this, but I'm absolutely convinced that the Roselli was not a mob hit. That was a CIA interrogation. Oh, I totally mob, agree. Oh, the yeah, mob does not use, they, they found para- paralyzing drugs in the system. The mob, that's Hollywood. Mob does not use, para- they probably can't even spell paralyzing. <laughs> they do not use it. They That was a CIA interrogation. Somebody wanted to know what Roselli said to the church committee. And I'm absolutely yeah. convinced of that. And Dan Hardway said there was an interview of Chef Edwards who um, had testified at Roselli's trial or who he had a relation. I think Chef Edwards had debriefed Roselli after the JFK assassination. And Dan Hardway read that and was very impressed by it, but he's never been able to find it since. And when the ARB went looking for it, they said that document doesn't exist anymore and you know dan has never talked about what's in it probably because he doesn't want to reveal secrets you know until they're declassified but there was evidently something really important in there we have still never seen and of course now that document apparently like the dulles calendar doesn't exist it may still exist somewhere and it may be in those files that we have yet to see released because biden basically said okay We consider our job done. We released everything that we think we could release and anything else is going to get into sources and methods of the CIA. It's like, well, we want sources and methods. We want to know who killed Kennedy and how. (laughs) Those are sources and methods. That's exactly what we need to know. And Lisa, all the rumors about Roselli, you know, there are rumors that he was training snipers at the CIA at the JM Wave Station. I mean, that's that doesn't make zero sense to me because Roselli no, wasn't a sniper. He wasn't even that really, like I said, like he a mob was a killer. Colonel in the army. I don't buy right. any of that. No, he yeah, well, diplomat no. is a good description. He was called yeah. the Silver Fox. Mayhew right. loved him. Mayhew buddied around sure. with him because he was suave and handsome and you know, and and even, and you yeah. know, there was that rumor that he was fired. He was shooting from the storm drain in Dallas. That's ridiculous because yeah. we know there's an FBI file that I seen that Roselli was in a, a hotel in Vegas when Kennedy was killed. And yeah. the FBI knew that they had him under surveillance. He was with a prostitute. Yeah, so he wasn't sense. in a storm drain in, in Dallas. So yeah. I think we just yeah. got to stop looking at Roselli as a mob guy. Roselli was more of a CIA contract guy who was a very valuable kind of logistics guy, kind of ambassador. He had so many connections. He'd be oh, useful yeah. to a guy like Mayhew. You right. Know, very and and he was totally blackmailable because he was operating under a fake alias. His really, real name was Filippo Sacco, Sacho, or sure. however you pronounce it. And and that's what the FBI was after him for, which is why Roselli asked for protection, because he didn't want to be deported back to Italy. You know, that was his big fear is, you know, once he got there, he'd really be killed. And uh, so the CIA, again, against Helms's wishes, ended up defending him a bit. So right. and that was the and- same trial that Grant Cooper, Sirhan's lawyer, was involved in and his behavior in that trial was held over his head until Sirhan was convicted and then Greg Cooper was given the lowest possible fine. You know, all, all this history actually connects and yet no history book tells these stories as if they connect. They tell them as if they're like these little anomalous events that just happened when yeah. that's not what's going on at all. Yeah, right. Oh, so interesting. I mean, yeah, this this is fascinating, you <laughs> yeah. know, and, and- yeah, I mean, just, I don't know, Lisa, is there anything but else you I, want to add? I, I just want to emphasize that the CIA's relationships with the media were so sensitive that when Congress did try to investigate that, the CIA dug in their heels and said, we're not going to tell you who our assets in the media are, because frankly, they were everybody that was anybody in the media. Hmm. 
And one guy kind of wrote that. He's like, the more important and valuable the reporter is perceived to be, the more awards they win, the closer they are to the CIA. So think of every talking head that you like and watch on TV. Those are the ones that the CIA has approved, or they wouldn't be there on TV. You wouldn't see them right. because they wouldn't sure. be allowed to rise that high. You know, so it's you know, like I said, just name somebody and, and they're probably CIA connected in some level. And some, how do I want to say it? Some of them were unwitting, meaning they have a friend who they rely on or who gives them tips and they don't know the friend is CIA. You know, it's like, that's often how it works. They mm -hmm. infiltrate. Not all of them know that they're being hand-led and hand-fed and promoted by the CIA, but they are. And this was so sensitive that when Congress tried to fight the CIA on this, Congress had to give in. CIA said, we'll show you the names of 40 people only. They had more than 400 media assets at that time, but they'll say, we'll show you a list. And I'm sure they did not show them the big names. I'm sure they showed them some small oh, yeah, names. Sure, sure. And they may, and then in the report, it sounded like it was mostly stringers and low-level reporters, but that that wasn't the case. And in the 1990s, Robert Gates had something called the CIA Task Force on Greater Openness. How can we have even more influence with the media, with <laughs> uh, Hollywood, with academia? And they had this whole document of ways that they could be. And in that, they say the Public Affairs Office now has relationships with every major news outlet in the country. And they say we've even been able to stop some stories before they got out, and we've been able to turn some intelligence failure stories into intelligence success stories. Oh. This document is on the internet. It's funny because there's a redacted version and an unredacted version, and you can find them both through Google search. If you search CIA task force on greater openness or greater CIA openness, you can read this document for yourself. I mean... The CIA runs the media, and that's how they got away with killing the Kennedys. Sure, it's right. like, if if you know you can get away with it because you can control the cover-up, because you control the media, what else have they done that we will never know? You know, mass yeah. murders, you know, plane downings. We will never know because the media will never investigate, because if they try to, the CIA will stop them. Yep. That's how it works. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Anyway, on that happy note, this is why you guys are important. No, but seriously, yeah. this is why this is why I wanted to help you guys, because you're not afraid to tell the truth. You know, it's these are important stories. And, you know, God bless you both for doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And, you know, you've been helping us so much. I mean, just with the guests that, that, that uh, we've been able to get because of you. Um, just just amazing. Amazing. So thank We're you. We're booked out away into December, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, I think that's awesome. Like I said, as long as you keep telling the truth, I will keep helping you. If you start saying, you know, the FBI killed Kennedy, I'm going to cut you off. <laughs> no, you're always going to get the truth from us, Lisa. No matter how I many know. people we piss off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and and when Don McGovern's episode hits next week, you know, I I, I know me and Don pissed off some some people with that one. So yeah, that'll be coming out. Well, it'll already be out before before this, <laughs> even though this yeah, is like an emergency emergency episode, right? Yeah, <laughs> no, no, Alan Dulles's calendar it it shows how connected he is with all the major players who probably were involved in the hit and, and the media that covered it up. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It's like all a right, map, well... right? To the to the to the truth. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Well, I hope you both avoid the storm that's coming in. And uh... <laughs> yeah, thank you. I hope so. <laughs> we'll hunker down. We'll batten down the hatches, right? <laughs> there you go. All right. Have a good All day. Right. <laughs> thank okay. you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank All you. right. Bye -bye. All right. Good night.